Well, if you like seafoods, I think you'll like our first story this week. We go to Mount Larkham here in Queensland and go out with a fisherman who catches mud crabs. They're huge, big mangrove crabs which weigh up to five kilograms. Then we go to Papua New Guinea, up here to the Karawari River, where we have a look at the lifestyle of the Karawari River people and see the making of sago, their staple food. This is a Queensland mud crab. They're quite famous in Queensland. Some people call them mangrove crabs and some people call them mud crabs. But whatever you call them, they taste just as nice. We've had a letter from Barry Seymour from Gosford in New South Wales who says, I've often enjoyed Queensland mud crabs and I would like to know where they come from. How did the fishermen go about catching them? So to find out, we're joining George Faint and Ernie Wilson from Mount Larkham in Queensland on their daily crabbing run. Their day begins at sunup, for on this occasion, that's when the tide is high, and George needs high tide to reach the narrow mangrove inlets. In this section of the Queensland coast, known as the Narrows, there are hundreds of unnamed inlets, all lined with mangroves, presenting an ideal mud crab environment. George has been crabbing here for over 10 years, with no sign of the crab populations decreasing until the last few years, when there has been an influx of crab fishermen, and now he must travel for hours to reach the more isolated spots where the biggest crabs are to be caught. Each day, George has a set routine. He must locate and empty every crab trap, rebait it if the bait needs replacing, and relocate the trap in a new location. Professional fishermen must be licensed, and each license allows him to operate up to 50 traps. Any female crabs in the traps are released, and only the males are taken. This is the law in Queensland, but in New South Wales, both sexes may be taken. Ernie's experienced hand makes the job of tying up those menacing claws look easy, but the crabs are strong and it's only with practice that each crab can be tied in a few seconds. Part of being a good crab fisherman is having a good memory. With 50 traps scattered over hundreds of kilometres of estuaries, it would be easy to lose one. George makes his own traps to replace those that rust away or are damaged. The crab claws are so strong, they can easily bend the wire mesh of the trap. Working as a team, George and Ernie can clear the traps a lot faster than if they worked independently in two boats. As Ernie ties up each crab, George rebates the traps with fresh meat. He uses beef offcuts, kangaroo meat and horse flesh. The meat is cut into fist-sized chunks and salted so it will last for several days in the trap. The traps are moved every day to a new location. Any undernourished crabs are thrown back. They fatten up in about three weeks and are always ready to be caught again. The 
day's work of clearing the 50 traps takes about seven hours and they cover hundreds of kilometres in the twisting, winding estuaries of the mangroves. By this time they must be heading home as low tide could strand the boat in some of the shallow spots. The traps are set in deep holes in the mud where the crabs still have some water when the tide runs out. Experience tells the professional where to plant the traps for the best crabs. Each crab is tested by pressing the underside shell. If it clicks, the crab is on the move and lean on meat. It's returned to the water even though it looks big and healthy. By the time George and Ernie have hauled the boat from the water, refueled for the next day and unloaded the crabs, they've already put in an eight hour day. But the crabs must still be taken home, boxed for shipping and new baits prepared for the next day's work. At George's home, the crabs are boxed ready for live shipment to the Brisbane markets, where they're sold by auction. The crabs generally are kept alive by restaurants and freshly cooked when ready to be served. See that green looking fella here? That fella there? He wouldn't be quite as full as that goldy looking fella. He'd be fully mature, that fella would be full of fat. Probably not quite as full. We're at Minge in the Western Highlands province of Papua New Guinea. We're going to fly from here to Karawari Lodge, which is down on the Sepik area. We're going with Adrian Nesbitt. the sea, we are not far above sea level. Adrian flies back to Minge and we board a fast river truck to make our way downstream to the lodge. The population of the Karawari River congregates along its banks in small villages. This area has no roads, all communication is via the river. It is the area's lifeline, running like a main artery into the Sepik and onto the sea.
is where a big canoe is being manufactured. Canoes like this one have been made by village people for centuries. The design hasn't changed, the only difference is the stone axe that was once used for this tedious task has been replaced by a much more efficient steel one. This huge log is about 10 metres long and was probably cut further upstream in the deep jungle and floated down to the village to be worked on. We were told a good canoe had about a two year life before it was discarded and the process of building started again. A grove of tall palm like trees in the middle of the village caught our guide's eye. He wished to purchase some of the tree's green fruit. This is the betel nut tree. Most villages have some. Many of the people are addicted to chewing the nut. They say it gives you a slight feeling of euphoria. It also helps to freshen the breath and clean the teeth. A betel nut chewer is very obvious by his or her red mouth. The hard nut is chewed with a mixture of lime made from seashells burnt in a fire. This makes the juice of the nut go bright red. <laughs> Nearly everyone chews betel nut in some form or another. Even young children have the telltale red lips. By sunset we are back at Karawari Lodge and are surprised to find very few mosquitoes. The Seabig area is full of swamps and is renowned for its prolific mosquitoes. Inside the main lodge building, amongst huge carved figures, we listen to some traditional bamboo flute music. These huge bamboo flutes are played at night in the villages for entertainment. This area and the Sepik in general was fabled for its once savage headhunting and cannibal tribes. Not too long ago, the villagers along the Karawari attacked each other and carried off their dead enemies to hack off their heads and eat their bodies at victory celebrations. This practice has been stopped and it is now illegal to keep heads. These two men told us they had collected heads in their youth and taken part in cannibal feasts. We'll be back after this break to see more of the Karawari River people. We're heading down the Karawari River towards the Sepik to visit Kundiman village, about 10 kilometres away. About halfway we stopped to look at a grove of tall native palm trees. The staple diet of the people of the Sepik area is saksak, or sago. These here are sago palms. We're standing in a grove of sago palms. The sago palms grow quite big and around the base about this size. They chop the palm down here in the bush and cut the head off it and put it into the river and float it down to the village where they extract the sago. The trunk section of the sago palm is usually cut into three metre lengths before they are floated down to the village. The sago comes out with them. It comes out like a juice. The water is mixed with this sago, and, it, and the sago sinks into the bottoms of the sago. And at last, you dip the water up, and you can get a substance that we call sago. It is like a white milk powder that you get.
Sago is a starchy substance found in the heart of the native sago palm. It takes about 10 to 12 years for the tree to reach maturity, and they are usually cut down just before they are due to flower. The sago palm grows in freshwater swamps and is the staple food of these river people. After the trunk is split down the middle, it is relatively easy to pulverise the soft fibrous core. The making of sago is an important occasion, so it is a good excuse for the people to dress up in their fine feathers and animal skins. It is usually the women's task to wash and filter the sago fibre. The pithy substance is transferred to a basket with a coarser weave for washing. A coconut shell on a stick makes a handy water ladle. Squeezing the basket full of soggy pith forces the flowery sago through the weave to be caught in a small wooden canoe. The coarse fibre is discarded and the water is carefully poured from the canoe, leaving a white sediment in the bottom. This sediment will be dried in the sun to make a pinkish coloured sago flower, which is stored in clay pots until required. Decorative pots full of sago flour line the walls of the village houses. The village is built higher up the river bank, above flood level, and overlooks this river flat. Fish is the main protein source of the Karawari River people. The river has a good supply of fish. I'm taken into the village to see how the sago is prepared for eating. This is sago and water mixed with the red colouring from the pandanus fruit. It is eaten just like this. Another method of preparation is by cooking sago in a clay dish on a bed of hot coals. This here is the final product of the sago. It's fried sago. It's a little bit like a pancake. Let's see what it tastes like. <laughs> Not bad. Don't really like to live on it though. Very chewy. <coughs> but they tell me that it's much better when you put meat and fish with it. A little bit like bread, I suppose. <coughs> Sago pancakes are enjoyed by all members of the village. <coughs> The people of the Karawari River are living in much the same way today as they were when the first white man came to this area in the 1930s. A fascinating remote area of Papua New Guinea. <laughs> Travel all over the country. 
countryside. Ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, travel all over the countryside. Ask the Leyland brothers. Whatever it is that you want to see, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, no matter whatever that happens to be. Ask the Leyland brothers. Come on, me in and then join in the fun. Travel all over Australia. Brother.